Hello, Space Dreamers. Some of you may know or not know that I started another podcast back in October called Indie Game International, where I interview independent video game developers all over the world. Well, I recently interviewed a gentleman named Shane Berry, who is the audio director for Demagogue Studio. The game that we talk about is called Golf Club Wasteland. The game is heavy on the hard science fiction, and the majority of the interview you are about to hear deals with the reality of humanity expanding beyond the cradle. This episode will act as a trailer for Indie Game International, my other podcast, as well as a nice sci-fi side dish to all this ACC entree. So I hope you enjoy this interview, and please go check out Indie Game International podcast everywhere you get your podcasts. New episode every Thursday. All right, thanks. Enjoy. All flights are now boarding. Welcome to Indie Game International. Welcome to the Indie Game International Podcast. Here we celebrate amazing games made by cool people and share knowledge and experiences with an indie game development. Grab that boarding pass, we're about to take off. What's up everybody? I am so glad that you are here. My name is Jared Parisi and as always, I am your host here at IGI. My mission is here is to celebrate amazing games made by cool people and share knowledge and experiences within indie game development. This is Video Game Score Composer Week here at IGI, and today we are talking to Shane Berry, the audio director for Demagogue Studios and one of the mad minds behind Radio Nostalgia from Mars. What is Radio Nostalgia from Mars? Well, it is not a video game. It is a fictional radio broadcast heard while playing through the immensely pleasurable Golf Club Wasteland, which is, of course, a video game. I was so impressed with the music and the sound design of this game that I simply had to reach out to the creators to get an interview. You can find Shane Berry's work on his website, www.shaneberry.com. That's S-H-A-N-E-B-E-R-R-Y. He's also on Twitter, at Shane Berry. And you can find him on Bandcamp as well as SoundCloud. You can get Golf Club Wasteland on PC, Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox. And you can find out more about the game itself at www.golfclubwasteland.com. All links mentioned will be in the show notes. In this episode with Shane, we will discuss many things, including questions like, is Mars a viable option for human expansion into the solar system and beyond? How important is the science fiction genre to our culture? We also talk about collaboration, the role of sound design in video game development. We also get into Demagogue's musical pipeline during production. All very, very interesting stuff. This is a pretty heady conversation that goes in many different directions, but advice for game devs can be found within. So I hope you enjoy. All right. So I'm here with Shane Berry, who is the, tell me what your title is at Demagogue. Well, we settled on audio director, but I, I'm carrying the mantle of like five audio positions, but the, for, e, for, for the ease, for the sake of ease, audio director audio director at demagogue studio um so shane if you wouldn't mind please give us the elevator pitch for golf club wasteland what is it but also what makes it unique and what role does sound and music play in this game well golf club wasteland is uh it's based on the premise that the world has gone to hell and the global elite have basically bailed on humanity and settled on Mars. But <clears throat> rather than finding the utopia that they expected, they've landed in the same <clears throat> problems that they have on Earth, but more condensed. <clears throat> so the role of the soundtrack, especially in terms of the radio, was to convey this alternate layer to the story of what you're seeing and juxtaposing that with a kind of 
dystopia that's unfolding on Mars, despite their wealth and despite their ability to have left trouble behind, they, they've, they've literally taken it with them, which is, which is what most of the research towards colonizing Mars points to, is that if we can't fix the problems here, like there is no planet B, is, the, is at the core of, of the soundtrack, at least, in terms of the radio content. Okay, that's really interesting because the score is called, and they call it in the game, Radio Nostalgia from Mars, which nostalgia yeah. is a call back to your past, right? That's right. So that's, that's right. I'm assuming that was intentional to call it that? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, I, I, in doing kind of my notes and, and research for, for speaking with you, I actually found the original brief. So mm-hmm. I can actually go that, through that with you. And um, this is what... These are the notes I took while I was chatting with with Simic. So okay. um, at the time, I was uh, we started development in 2017 actually for because Gokla Wesson was originally a mobile game. Okay. So um, we we had at that point, Igor Igor is the idea guy. Let's be clear on that. So that okay. it's a it's a hundred percent um a hundred percent collaboration with him without eagle simic there is no radio nostalgia for mars and there is no golf club wasteland it is his idea right. and my role my role in working with eagle through his many many projects we've done a lot of short films together we've done a lot of artistic installations together is to realize the audio part of his vision or his ideas because he can't do it if he could do it he would <laughs> but he right. can't so he got he you i I step in and go, okay, this is how we would execute this idea. So he came to me and he said, look, we're going to do, we, we had um, done this um, very short work together on another game called Child's Play. Very simple mobile game where you smack kids working on a, on a conveyor belt to keep them awake to maintain pro- productivity <laughs> in your sweatshop. Got it. And um, at the end of the, at the end of the game, I, voice the teddy bear that they're making i did this i had this ridiculous voiceover and igor heard me doing this voice and said hey do you want to be in my game and that's kind of how we met and ever since then he's had this ear and these ideas and then i go that's totally insane let's do it so um he he came to me with a fully fledged idea he was like i want this radio show um and it must be realistic it must be based on Mars. It must be a radio show. And the overall tone of this station is nostalgia with a retro future soundtrack. These are he, literally his words. Got it. Um, so it would be inspired by artists like Kavinsky, M83, Anderson Park, you know, that kind of like um, that retro synth wave. Yes, yes. I totally um, know what you're saying. So we had notes on like tone. So he, was, he, he said um, it should be like a chill morning show. And that Mars itself is in, is a work in progress. So there was this whole idea that they were still setting up at the time of the radio show right. being done, which is where all the meat of the kind of science fiction side of it comes from. Because I'm an avid science fiction reader. Awesome. So um, Igor is an avid reader, but he's more into, you know, he's a grad, a Columbia grad of like philosophy and film school. So he's more on that academic um, philosophical side of things where I, I'm more on the side of, um, you know, straight up science fiction, hard sci-fi, um, Ben Bova, um, Neil Stevenson, and and um, that kind of, you know, hard hardest stuff. Yeah, I can so, tell. I can tell from Radio Nostalgia for Mars that you guys have the proper uh, inspirations. I guess you would say it, it, it all gels with the sci-fi that I like to read personally. Oh, that that means a lot to me, man. Because I. I having seen what you did with the space dreamers, you know, with that, the Arthur C. clock stuff, that, that means a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the sci-fi largely comes from, from me, if I do pat myself <laughs> on the back. Uh, so it was, again, my job with Igor across all of our projects is to simply um, take what he's firing at me, distill it and then, and put out some kind of result uh, in an audio perspective. But of course there was shaping the story there was a lot of incongruencies in the early drafts of the story, especially around time. Okay. So you'll notice, um, although I do riff a lot on the compli- how very complicated Martian time is, um, 
that we don't, there is no official time that this takes place because we kind of wanted it to exist in like a timelessness. So in the original drafts of the script, I was doing like salt, like um, timestamps, you know, it's now it's Martian hour 6.35 AM and now it's time for the news. Those were the original kind of um, uh, POCs we call that proof of concept. I'll use the word POC a lot. It means proof of concept. So I do a lot of POCs, um, a lot where we just um, go, hey, will this work? Um, and will it work and how will it work Is are the, are the questions I answer for Eagle in terms of audio. So originally he wanted a live broadcast. Okay. was the original idea. Um, and the original idea was that it would be the two of us having a conversation and then people calling into the show, like, a, like an actual talk show. Right. Okay. But once I started digging into the research um, uh, of what it would, what they would actually mean to be communicating in real time with Mars, it's really complicated. Right. Depends on how far Mars is. Time delay. Depends on, on, yeah, time delay. Depends on if it's, you know, um, how far away it is, how close it is. So you're looking like five minutes to 15 minutes. And then to, to wrap that into a time scale of time stamping stories and then having people call it, it was like, it, it wouldn't work. It would be right. impossible unless we do some kind of quantum, you know, entanglement kind of communication where it's instantaneous. Right. It's, it's never going to work on that level. Okay. So that, that's where I had the idea of, of doing the, um, the, well, I mean, I, when I say I, I mean, Igor and I settling on things um, Got it. is that we decided to, let's um let's go like a podcast um you know like a a one shot that's being tight themed you know just some light sci-fi twists on you know broadcast don't call it a broadcast call it a tight beam you know these kind of tropes i see okay it's interesting because you you often find that science fiction uh is able to predict the future and the reason for that is that the sci-fi writer only has to write the engineer has to actually come up with the idea like the sci-fi writer and then actually engineer the thing. So it almost sounds like you guys are one step ahead of, you're kind of foreseeing the problems that might arise when humanity is on Mars and wants to potentially beam a radio broadcast to earth. Sounds like it wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So part of the, part of the, I think where Igor and I, um, kind of gelled so well, especially in terms of the soundtrack, uh, Radio Nostalgia from Mars, is that I realized quite early on um, that the radio show would have to be a foil to the absurdity of the main plot. Okay. Because essentially the main plot is untenable. It takes seven months to get to Earth from Mars on a good day. Right. So you're looking at these ultra-rich guys taking out a year plus change of their life to go play a game of golf. It right. is beyond absurd because that is, that is the reality of it. Right. So, so in the initial drafts and ideas that we we're going around and, and we, we discussed this at length. I mean, we were discussing, you know, um, McLuhan, how his thoughts on radio, um, Bertolt Brecht, you know, all of these great big thinkers about their, their um, relationship to radio and how it's, um, the, the, the medium, the power of the medium of radio. And I realized very early on that we couldn't lean into the absurdity uh, more. We couldn't amplify it because it, it, became, it, became, not, it became beyond parody. It's hard to ex- explain in words. I but see what you mean. It, need, it needed to, when you start researching um, what it would really like to be on Mars. And I'll give you a couple of, of examples of, of where, I, where I was looking and, and some very interesting people that we met along the way. It's all very cosmic. Um, is that the, the reality of living on Mars is already astonishingly absurd. Right. Like it, it's like, I don't know if you know that subreddit, Not the Onion, where they give you headlines that are not parody, that really happen, but it looks right. like it's written for a parody. When you realize that living on Mars is a living parody. It's a living joke. It's that there was enough. Yeah, it's ridiculous inherently. You didn't have to amplify it. Yeah. 
So in the, in the initial drafts, we were, well, we might still do this because there's, a, there, there, I mean, hopefully there's more Radio Nostalgia from Mars um, episodes coming, is we were looking at how different things would, how different things would become valuable on Mars. So you would have these ultra rich take, uh, you know, the, the mistress of a Russian oligarch taking all of her Jimmy Choo shoes. But what value do they have in Mars? Right, right. So just that idea can is food for 10 or 15 PSAs, you know, right. uh, recyc- uh, would they be recycled? What kind of value would they have? Would they be tradable? Um, what would what would five Jimmy Choo shoes be equal to in on Mars? Okay, that kind those kind of questions. It writes itself basically. Right, right. Well, it's yeah. it's interesting. And, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's interesting. No, no problem. Because I I discovered the game on the Switch, and what attracted me to it was not golf. I don't have any interest in golf uh, as a game or as a real sport. But what attracted me to it was the visual aesthetic. Uh, the sci-fi part of it. And so yeah. then once I jumped in and I realized like the first little cinematic you get that explains what's going on, that basically rich people like that earth was destroyed in an ecological disaster, rich, yeah. everyone, rich people live on Mars and really rich dudes go to Mars just to play, or I'm sorry, go back to earth just to play golf. And I, I remember I found myself explaining that to like telling my friend being like, can you believe that that's the story? And, but it was, I only had to explain the absurdity of it in just one little sentence, you know, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a perfect elevator pitch. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, and it's like, once you learn that the whole situation, the fact that I'm playing a game that I don't, uh, the fact that I'm playing a simulation of a sport that I don't necessarily have an interest in everything around it, as long as the gameplay works and is, and is fun everything around it is just so intriguing because like you said, it's so absurd. Yes. And, and so uh, what, so part of what I brought to the table in terms of writing the radio script as the, the, as the, as the narrator or the DJ is bringing some of that uh, grounding the world because I, I've always found sci-fi that's um, a little bit, uh, that sci-fi that's plausible is far more powerful than sci-fi that's just completely, you know, that magic juju. Star Wars. Stuff. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't want to start a flame war, but yeah, I, that stuff doesn't appeal to me at all. Like, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, I, I would don't say, get it. I Well, I will say in, in a non-derogatory way, in my opinion, Star Wars is fantasy that happens to take place in space. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 And, um, I remember once reading uh, this novel when I, I was uh, when I had more time, and it was it was ostensibly a sci-fi novel, and I realized that it was actually a, a political thriller. It must have originally been a political thriller, and yeah. all they did was instead of the FBI agents pulling out uh, a Glock, I don't know what guns the FBI use, but, you know, like a Smith & Wesson right, right. 38 or whatever. Right. He was pulling out a, a laser, you know, ray nitro, gun. Yeah, nitro ray gun. And it was like, wait a minute. Like, there's just this, like, superficial, like, um, rewording or, or like a, a science fiction thesaurus. of I mean, what would you call a gun? So, I mean, that that is a tricky, it is a tricky line to walk because I mean that's essentially what we did with the radio shows. We just we did that science fiction the source, but hopefully in a in a much smarter way than right. than this political thriller. So that the, the reason I bring up that political thriller that was masking it a sci, masking itself as sci-fi is that that was very influential in being careful of that of coming across as just making it science fiction for science fiction's sake. If that makes sense, so yeah. there was always this idea to ground it somehow i'm really curious in reality i'm really curious like at what point did it become about golf like at what point did golf become the gameplay mechanic because everything about it that intrigues me is not the golf you know what i mean this uh well that's a great question that's exactly how uh that's how simich works as an artist and a visual artist and it's how i work so um 
it, don't come to me and say, make a piece of music because nothing will come out of that. Right. But come to me and say, hey, man, wouldn't it be cool if we recorded like a whole bunch of pigs and then we made a video of those pigs or whatever? It doesn't matter. And I'll go, oh, cool. Because if this, this, and then my mind stops. Okay. So at the very core of, from the very beginning, it was about rich people going to Mars to play golf. It was there from the very beginning. Okay. It's based on a picture. So, I mean, I've sat through Simich talking about this at game conferences many times. There is a, there's a photograph that started the whole process. Okay. It's a guy in Florida playing golf while behind him, there's a literal forest fire okay yeah you have the green golf the green lush watered golf course and literally the background is on fire like for real it's not a photoshop image it's just a guy playing golf while the world is burning behind him right and and that is what that is where simich got the idea he was like this is this because that the parody writes itself yeah i mean it's it's funny how much golf is the butt of so many jokes you know what I mean? Well, like, it, yeah, I, wonder at, it, I wonder at what point it became that. You know what I mean? Well, it was always, um, it always has been a symbol of wealth and privilege right. and exclusivity and exclusion. I mean, how long did it take them to, to allow women and, and, and black people to join some of the bigger clubs uh, around the world? Yeah, it, 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 it took a long time for golf to catch up with modern sensibilities in terms of inclusion. Let's just put it that way. So golf becomes the perfect um, medium for uh, expressing this elitism because it has always been viewed as it's an expensive sport to get involved in. The, the mm-hmm. equipment is expensive. Uh, it's, uh, golf courses come at an ex- enormous expense to the environment. Right, because and, they have to be watered. They they're non they're true. non they're not biodiverse. I'm sure that there's some biodiverse initiatives on some golf courses, but in general, like in the past fifty years, golf course is not the best thing to happen to the local environment. Right, and it's by a long shot, it's monocultural. What you were just saying about the the image, it reminds me of. There's that famous video footage of uh, George W. Bush, the. Pre- past president of the United States and he 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 he's being filmed for some kind of media and he looks right at the cameras and he, and he addresses them and he's he's condemning terrorism right and yeah. then the camera pan zooms out and he goes now watch this drive and he hits the ball and it's like yeah that's that's crazy I, I don't yeah yeah so it, it's in it line with the this, message I think yeah it's it's that complete disconnect right because it, it and 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 but and this is what's crazy about the premise is we know that it's plausible. We mean, know it's inherently plausible because Bezos just proved it. He literally just proved it. He put right. on a cowboy hat and he went into low Earth orbit at the at, at the expense of everybody on the planet. For what? So they they are already demonstrating that there's a class of human beings on this planet that would do what happens in golf club wasteland, regardless of how absurd it is. It's, it's amazing that I was totally enamored with this game. And then now talking to you, I'm realizing like so much more about, it's almost like you're explaining why I love it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's weird. Cool. Thanks man. I appreciate it. Uh, well, um, there, there's no joke that a lot of thought went into it that, um, from, from the, the research side into, um, into what, from my side in terms of what it actually means to be on Mars. So what, one of the greatest uh, like cosmic incidents is that, uh, as I mentioned, Igor and I do a lot of, um, of his artistic work um, as well. So he's, a, he's a represented by a gallery in Frankfurt, uh, Anita Becker's gallery, quite a prestigious um, German gallery. And we exhibited... In 2017, at the B3 biennial of the moving image, okay. we did an installation of our project Spine 2.0. So um, we made a fake, we made a fake um, um, promo video for a, a, an embeddable spine that will give you moral guidance. Okay. So it was literally a backbone for spineless yeah. competitions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, the installation is a 3D printed spine, or uh, three of them. And um, then the the mock mock video 
of of the like um you know like a shopping channel kind of uh, infomercial that's the word yeah. i'm looking for and then tied to that is a fake uh dating app called x hots y and part of the installation is a credit card with your name on it and that's the dating app that's tied to getting the spine 2.0 technology implanted in your body you'll link with other people who have the same technology and then you when you buy the video you get your card printed okay so uh, we so uh, we exhibited there the point being is that Igor and I went across, I was living in Paris at the time and we were exhibiting at, um, in Frankfurt and Igor came up from Belgrade and we met in Frankfurt and in, and at that time, 2017 is when we were in pre-production for Golf Club West and the ideas were just germinating. And one of the, one of the exhibitors at the B3 Biennale um, in 2017 was a, an American uh, video artist called Janet Diggs. And she's a research based kind of interdisciplinary um, artist. She does a lot of immersive work, some very interesting stuff. And her film at that exhibition was a film called Afar with these people walking through these kind of volcanic landscapes. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like a three, three part video. Anyway, we, I, I like to film and we, cause we were uh, like on, on like the artists level of meeting the other artists and stuff like that. And when we bumped into her, um, we kind of got on very well and we ended up having a ramen with her like at one o'clock in the morning. And she just in the middle of the conversation just said, Oh, by the way, I was in one of those Mars habitat experiments. Wow. Yeah. And was like, what? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent like uh, six months like living in one of those uh, mock Mars environments as, uh, as like an artistic coordinator, blah, 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 because that's what she does. And I was like, holy shit. And we spent the next like six hours picking her brain of what it was right. like to be. So we actually had firsthand account okay. of someone who's been in that experience. That sounds like and fake. She, that's crazy. Yeah, it's cosmic, dude. It was like yeah. Igor and I were just grinning from ear to ear because we we learned so much from her because it was first-hand account. It wasn't like my friend's friend, right? right. She literally, she was explaining or mo- a lot of the stuff. So that meeting was the, the billiard ball that set everything in motion in terms of the direction that the, the Mars, uh, that the radio nostalgia from Mars would take because we realized that the reality was absurd enough that you could just talk about basic problems on Mars and it's funny because we were laughing. Right. Like um, it really is the case that board games are not allowed because people, they, they, they are so cramped that yeah. they start fighting and it, it messes up all of the intra dynamics of the group. So, so they, no- they had to say, no, no play. board games. They're not allowed to play at all. No, no, or at least very, very mildly. Like it has to be heavily monitored because the the tensions just get too much, and they're so cramped they can't escape right. each other. It just creates all of these psychological problems that they that they have yet to like unwind and and deal with. Now, um, there is a great podcast that I then uh, so she lent me a book called What Future, and in that. Uh, book there's an essay called my life on simulated mars which is not written by her but that is someone else who had the same experience okay and through through that essay i got onto a podcast called the habitat life on mars which is a six part like one and a half hour each podcast uh, of one of the people as well so there were these multiple like first-hand accounts of what it was like to be on mars and and from those um from those essays and podcasts and stuff, I started culling like what would what would a radio host need to be addressing to keep people informed but entertained at the same time. Okay. So then uh, when we did the when we did the initial outline, um, we realized that first of all, <clears throat> space exploration is not going to be military, clearly. It is clearly leading towards corporate, right? Control. Privately funded. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Profit, profit-driven private enterprise. Yep. So that is why we don't have a um, military hierarchy in the game at all. It's all corporate hierarchy. So um, the the 
corporation sponsors the show. It's not it's not like a it's not like a military radio, for example. It. It's okay. strictly corporate. It's sponsored. It's capitalistic. The the place itself is run like a company. There's a CEO of Mars of Tesla City. There isn't a yeah. governor. There isn't a mayor. There's a CEO of the city. So there's all these like layers and layers of just pointing out that this is going to be a, a capitalist corporate environment that people are they're basically a shopping mall. <laughs> You're moving in a shopping mall. Right to Mars, and um, so then we would. What in this world there would be? One would still have to radio would have to function as a kind of propaganda. Okay, you, you would have to placate the people on Mars. Right, there yeah. there would have to be some kind of anesthesia involved. Hence the nostalgia part of the radio show. Right, it's kind of a a, a subversion, or um, um, how do you say? It? It's kind of a, a joke in and of itself that the radio is about nostalgia because it's, it's essentially to placate the psychology of the elite on Mars. Right. To make them feel good about being there. Okay. To yeah. let them vent, to let them talk about the past. Yeah. In, 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 uh, so, for example, then that gives us a whole wealth of stuff because then what would they be warned about? Because they're basically toddlers. Yeah, they're spoiled toddlers, right? Mm -hmm. So you would have to speak to them in a way that you know. By the way, don't waste water. By the way, you know, just bear in mind that other people exist. You know, please, please be kind. You know, these kind of things. Wait, what? Isn't so, there, isn't there a character who was like a? I could be wrong, but he he was like a a, a gasoline worker or like a yes. a miner. Was yes, he, was he elite? I can't remember. No. So that's so. This is this raises a whole lot of problems. Is that uh, it, it couldn't just be the elite that make it because they they the elite can't function by themselves. I mean, yeah. this is just a fact. Right. A billionaire can't run a yacht without people who are not billionaires. Right. Exactly. So this is one of the first things that we kind of ran into. Is like there would be an underclass, even though the elite made it to Mars, there would still be an underclass just by the nature of human society. I mean, even if you go into a small village or the, the countryside in any any part of the world if you go into tribal regions of africa there's a hierarchy it, it, it emerges as an as an essential part of a functioning society let's say around 100 people we never discussed how many people are actually on the city but it's it's more than the threshold of uh, a small village for sure okay i was curious it's about that yeah it's function in my mind it's functioning <laughs> as a city so a large city that was one thing, and we haven't even gotten to like the smaller story, which is about the guy, the the main character. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Totally. my question is, since you mentioned that, is it was it only one ship that left Earth? It's a great question. We we discussed that for ages. I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. Okay, I mean, it could be like First a of all, arc, maybe. Yeah, here's the problem uh, for for. Um, in reality, which is where I was firmly planted when I was doing the research, is that all of the Mars, um, the most likely way that we would get to Mars is uh, um, is launching from the moon. Okay. So we would get the resources up to the moon. Yeah. It would be packaged there and we would leave from the moon. That's the most realistic way of doing it. So, uh, escape velocity, um, fuel, all that kind of stuff. So the whole idea ostensibly was that the original idea is there was a giant ship that took like a hundred people to Mars. Okay. But if you really start digging down into the actual reality of it, and like I said, I was, I was kind of a stickler in the mud about that because I, I did feel that there had to be a plausibility in at least the science fiction aspect of it. The, the speculative fiction would be more accurate okay. of going, if, if there's a lot of people going to Mars, you would have to, there would be people who, who, fake their way there would be people who bribe their way there would be people who got in there by mistake it's just mathematic it's mathematical so that that was the joke kind of joke of the gasoline worker right is that he just was in the right place at the right time now he's on mars okay right because okay. that would happen it's it's, right. it's impossible that it wouldn't that yes. there would be just some guy like just bump, like a kind of inspector clouseau kind of character just stumbling Bumbling. Yeah. yeah, failing upwards, basically. 
Right. And also that would, that's a commentary on bureaucracy. It's a commentary on, um, again, uh, overt capitalist exploitation of workers because, you know, those guys were dying. They were moving very uh, toxic chemicals. The, the Mars authorities knew that. They didn't care. They just wanted the fuel to get up to Mars. Right. So in the game for storytelling Vaseline, they they take off from Earth, but in reality, that's not what we're really storytelling about. Vaseline. I've never heard that term. That is perfect. Oh, I'm just I'm riffing at the moment, but yeah, it's 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 just making the story work because exactly. you can't be uh, you can't be absolutely realistic all the time. Otherwise, because right. then then the premise doesn't work. You, so you have to go into the 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 fiction side of it has to exist. Right. I, and it's funny because this podcast is supposed to be about like video game development, but I'm such a huge sci fi. No, it's fine. I'm such yeah. a sci fi fan, but I'm, <laughs> I'm totally interested in this stuff because I just, the most recent Space Dreamers episode that I recorded was about the Fountains of Paradise, which is about building a space elevator, which is yeah. solving that problem that you're talking about. It's so difficult to yes. take from Earth. <clears throat> yes. Um, have you by any chance seen the film Ad Astra? Yes. Because that. I mean, I remember the director said that his whole purpose in making that movie was to make the most realistic depiction of, of humans in space ever put on. Yeah. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> the soundtrack, I don't know if you paid attention, the score to that movie is so amazing. It's so good. Yeah, yeah that sound design is great. So I think um, you, got, you guys are just tapping into like this, I don't know, maybe like this new modern science fiction that is looking backwards. And I, I recently had this conversation with uh, someone on my podcast about in the future, if, if humanity survives all the, the perils that we're kind of creating for ourselves right now, if we do yeah. past all these things that we're afraid of that might destroy the earth and we look back at this time, what are we going to think about the art that we create now, the science fiction that we create now? It's so it's always so negative. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just well, put that we about us. We we talked about that a lot because I mean I'm from South Africa and and um, I'm very very conscious of of what's come to be known as as uh, a tourism. You know the the tourism for for the poor of you know going to look at poverty and then you know bouncing back to your own reality. Uh, your you know the comfy you know first world problems of like. Right. Um, water that isn't cold enough out of the tap kind of level of problems. And um, <clears throat> so we, we were very conscious of this kind of echo tourism in the game of like, uh, or of champ championing the apocalypse where this is more kind of what, what um, McLuhan, uh, sorry, I have to quote here. Um, he had this book. Um, yeah. Forward through the rear view mirror. So it, it's that, that sense that we're, we're always kind of, if, if you, you mentioned it earlier that, you know, if you, you just have to write about what's happening now is enough to project what's happening in the future, but you can only really look back on it. Right. right? So we're, that, that was the, the premise of, of the game is that we're looking back on this time now. Right. Okay. And it automatically becomes sci-fi. It's bizarre because yeah. we're not saying anything. We're not making anything up. Uh, apart from the golfing and the absurd premise, of course, right. but but we're just it's just a comment on what's happening right now. But we're just saying, oh, we're looking back on this time, but we're not. We're 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 here now. That that's that forward through the rearview mirror kind of um, concept that was at the core of the development of the soundtrack and the radio script. The game is extremely. It's pretty obvious, pretty early on, like just how topical the game is and how much of a commentary it is on life today. I mean, there are specific yes. references to uh, let's say um, Twitter blunders by certain people. Certain yes. People in yes. The world. Uh, yes. And, and especially the song. Um, oh shoot. Let me try to find the title. The one love surveillance. What's that one? Sur oh, surveillance love song. Yeah, like that song is like that is completely and totally how we live. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. are you spying on yeah. me or do you love me? You know what I mean? Kind yeah. of both. So, so um, that 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 uh, I scored with Igor. So um, 
I know I know that uh, we're kind of uh, seem to be left field of, of the main topic, but I, I I just want to to remind anybody that has um, that is listening that what I'm talking about it was inherently part of the development process of of the soundtrack. There was no way to get the soundtrack to where it was without what we're talking about because Igor and I definitely talked about this for hours. Okay. So all of this was part of that pre-production. Okay. How is this going to work? How is this going to fit? And all the technical stuff comes later because the, okay. uh, what a lot of people these days tend to forget is that um, most people have access to good software. Most people have access to a decent mic. Most people have access to in the Western world. Yes. And um, they, they, uh, the uh, ability to create something of great value is very easy. So technologically, Yes. So one has to rely on ideas, in our opinion, which is where Igor comes in because he has the ideas. And it's just my role to technologically make them come to fruition. That is very insightful. And it speaks, totally speaks truth to me. Like, I recently started a, basically a podcast editing service. Basically, I... Yeah will do all because I've worked for a podcast for the past five years. So I know how to produce this whole thing. Yeah. So I'm offering it as a service to people. And I, my company is called Sumadre because everyone yeah. and their mother has a podcast. Yeah. I love it. So the, the whole point is it's like, it's almost, it's hard. To, it's just, it's, it's ringing true to what you're saying. And that like, literally, like you said, anyone can talk into a microphone. Yes. The ones, the ones that are going to be successful are the ones that are are as well thought out, or maybe you're just ridiculously talented and, and fun to listen to. But what you're proving to me right now is that there's, there is a massive amount of planning and thought that goes into making something as simple as a little golf game that makes it stick in my mind. And you're just, you're just amplifying my, my love and my appreciation for this game. And it, it's amazing. Oh, thank you. It's amazing to me. Like, the golfing mechanics are sound, right? But yeah. I found myself not once while I was playing that game that I find myself propelled and 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 finding enjoyment in going forward because of the golfing. Yeah, it's it's it was never that. It's always the atmosphere, and I guess my love for sci-fi is also amplified as well by. I think we're kind of aligned in terms of like our, our influences and, and what. Yeah. We're... Yeah. And I'm a big, I'm, I'm a big clock fan. Uh, Asimov, uh, you know, runs the gamut. Uh, Philip K. Dick is my, my not on the list because he's on his own list. Right. Okay. He's my guy. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I just wanted to, to point that out that uh, we are, by talking about this, we are talking about how the how the game sound was developed because it was it was um, it was born out of this photograph of the guy playing in front, and then Igor came to move these notes. We want this realistic. Now, in terms of my background, I have worked in radio. I, I, when I first moved to Tokyo in two thousand, um, uh, I joined a small uh, cable radio show called Radio One. And we were developing pre-recorded radio shows for a very big cable network here called USEN. And basically, they were a cable network that piped uh, music into uh, big shopping centers and cafes. So the idea was that you, instead of paying like a, a copyright license or whatever, performance fee license, you would buy a USN box and you could stream your choice of radio shows into your cafe or into your work environment. And we were the only alternative music radio station broadcasting on USN, on USN. Um, so that's where I cut my teeth in terms of learning how to um, make jingles, how to, um, how to put together an hour. Sh the shows were an hour. And that's actually why Radio Nostalgia um, from Mars, the episodes themselves, are one hour blocks because that's where I'm most comfortable producing Okay. Um, because of the, my background in radio. Then of course I, I was doing a lot of live shows on the techno scene here in Japan in the mid two thousands. Um, so that involved um, producing. I, I only played my own original music. I was assigned to a few record labels at the time. So that was me working and reworking and creating new material once every two weeks I would create a new or updated live show. So I was working 
on seven or eight tracks simultaneously for five years. So did you, did you pull any influence from any other video game in terms of, I mean, having a radio show as a soundtrack to a video game isn't, is definitely not brand new. I think you guys do it in an extremely innovative and interesting and entertaining way. But were there any other games that you guys looked to for inspiration or was it, was it not? Yeah. Um, I'm not much of a gamer anymore. I'm a bit, I'm a bit more voyeuristic. So I watch a lot of playthroughs. So there's a couple of guys on YouTube that I like watching. I appreciate, I appreciate the way they play the game. Okay. Um, and uh, so there's one or two where I've sat through, um, uh, you know, because I, I get an opportunity to to hear the game and, and look at other things rather than concentrating on how to jump across a gap, you know. Okay. Yep. So um, uh, the, the the playthroughs on, on YouTube have been immensely helpful to me because I can keep up with modern games without actually having to buy the hardware and, you know, spend 40, 50 hours playing a game. I can just right. watch highlights and stuff. So, yes, um, Bioshock 2. Okay. Where they go around and find the little radio yes. control things that tell the story. Big influence. Um, we, we talked about that at length. Of course, Gran Turismo 4, which is what I was playing at the time. You know, there's the radio show playing when you start okay. the cars, all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, um, Grand, Grand Theft Auto, of course. Yes. Okay. Which I've I, not played, but I know enough about it. That's so. okay. That, that, was, that was what I wanted to bring up was that since I was a kid, I've always thought like the greatest fictional radio station ever was in grand theft auto three there's a i think it's called like lips fm or something like that where it's just talk it's radio talk and there's the character yeah. the, the dj's name is laszlo and he is so funny it is it is some of the it's one it's like the best part of the game forget the shooting forget yeah. the just driving yeah. around listening to laszlo is so funny but i have to say that radio nostalgia from mars surpasses that in my opinion Thank you very much. Seriously. Look, we had a, there was a huge, I mean, again, going back to, to the, the, the pre-production, um, p- part, of the, um, part of the process of figuring out how exactly it would be implemented into the game was that Igor and I come from a film background because we worked on his short films and, uh, and I come from a um, commercial audio background, you know, doing uh, audio for Stingers, for Red Bull and, and um, Riot and all these kind of things, you know, very short 30 second, cha, 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 you know, this is a new game thing. Yeah, yeah. So for us, uh, the, 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 under, the underlying framework has always been cinema more than anything else, more than game, because everything is about cinematic. Uh, so our um, amazing art director, um, Nicholas Stepkovich, is who's um, responsible for all of the artwork, we have, we have a thing where he will make an animation and I will respond by, Oh, this is what I think goes with that animation. And he'll be like, that's exactly like I was listening to the same song, like, you know, in a similar genre while I was making it. So there's this kind of deeper connection that it's hard to explain, but there's a collaborative connection that's also working. Like, so there's layers upon layers in there in where I'm responding to, um, artwork, the artwork is responding to the to the the music and the radio show. The story is responding to how the three of us are collaborating because it's it's the three of us that kind of balance out because the artwork balances the story, balances the sound. It's yeah. that kind of um, trifecta. The trifecta of of creativity that kind of solidifies and makes everything make sense in a way because they are literally playing with one another. That's for example, if you turn off radio nostalgia from Mars and you just listen to the sound effects, yeah. they are designed to work in and of themselves without a soundtrack playing over. Okay. And that's in direct response to the the environment that Stepkovich created. So there's a there's a 100 percent push pull between visuals, audio, and between the sound design and the and the um, the game objects themselves. Okay. So we I mean, not even talking about radio nostalgia from Mars. There's a whole other pipeline of the sound design. What everything is going to sound like. What the what the dish is going to sound like. What the giraffe is going to sound like. What the cow is going to sound like. Right. All of these things are. Uh, do we make them realistic? Do we make them slightly cartoonish? There's a whole other discussion, and so, that all has to fold under the radio show. Right. Which this is cinematic. Is yes. So, 
in terms of game audio, the the the, the radio show is uh, was originally meant to be diegetic, which means it was meant to be playing inside Charlie's helmet. Okay. I wanted it to have it filtered. Right. I wanted it such that you couldn't really hear what was going on. That Got would it. have been a joke. He's listening to. I wanted the I wanted the whole soundtrack to be unlistenable. <laughs> but I got overridden. So they said, no, you've got to hear this cool music. I'm like, okay, I get it now. But at yeah. the time I wanted it to be kind of funny that there's this full on soundtrack that only he can hear. And somehow maybe you could unlock it later. Well, you got, you did kind of pull that off. I love when he goes underground and you can't hear it anymore. Yeah. I love, I love that you pointed out that was our solution. That was um, okay. actually, uh, I think it came up with one of our devs. Um, um, Ivan Stankovic, he's, he's the guy that helps me the most with implementing the sound. Him and uh, uh, um, Mali, they, they work together to help me implement the sound from a coding point of view because I don't code as right, well right. as I would like to. I would- um, they came up with that idea saying, hey, why doesn't the radio switch off when he goes underground? Then we'll get this idea that um, we are actually listening to the radio show. And it was like, problem solved. Perfect. It's diegetic in quotes. Right, right. And it, and it makes you realize that like you as the player, it, it becomes that much more precious when it comes back. You know, you're like, I, oh, thank you. well, yeah. I understand why this radio show exists and why this person would be listening to this radio show while on earth, because being on earth as a wasteland would be awful, you know, in total silence. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. I think you would need that even as fake and like put on as that radio show is. You know what I mean? You would need that. I'm really curious, though, since you come from a film background, right? Yeah. I have always been, not that it matters, because all art is just art, but I've always been a a proponent for video games, that video games are art. And I think that... Yeah. I think that indie games show that a lot more than AAA games. Not to to say anything negative about AAA games, but, you know, indie games have more freedom to be more niche, more, you know, out there. Yeah. Um, like, how do you feel about, and how does the experience differ? What are the benefits? Like, like as someone who you, like you've played your own game, right? You've played golf club. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know how to really frame this question, but like, what, what are people who just watch people who just binge television, people who just watch the occasional movie, Right people who maybe read young adult books, what are they missing when it comes to storytelling and immersion when they don't, if they don't even look at video games, when they think of it as just a thing that's not for them, maybe for kids. Yeah. I, I, I think video games are, have um, kind of replaced that um, mindset that comics and graphic novels had in the late nineties and and two thousands where, you know, they were seen as books for kids basically, you know, and now with the MCU universe and Marvel videos, kind of uh, Marvel movies kind of, you know, becoming full on adult entertainment. I think that, that there's, there's a time lag between gaming reaching that level. I think that um, personally, I think that gaming is the future of storytelling. I love it. I think this, yeah. I, I do think that. And um, you can look at, at, at games like Death Stranding as a good example of that, where that is a full on, that is a movie. Oh, yeah. It's just a movie. It's a choose your own adventure movie. Yeah. And, Especially, and, um, and it's funny you say that too, because in terms of sound and music, I'll never forget when I first booted up that game, you, ha- you do this one little menial mission and then you have to walk to your base or whatever and you come over this hill and you see this fucking gorgeous graphics you see the bass far away and it plays this music and like i'll never forget that music and i remember when i first heard it i was like i don't like this music you know like on its own but it just works so well and and like all of a sudden you're just there in that game yeah that's a congruency that's yeah um so one of the other things it's 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 interesting that you bring that up because one of the stipulations that Eagle had from the very beginning is that the soundtrack itself would always be standalone and not always could also be standalone. Right. Right. <clears throat> so there, there and was like, Oh, thanks for that. Because in the, in the initial mobile game, the actual quality of the audio didn't really matter. 
Okay. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I shudder to think of the quality of uh, in from a from an artistic and music production point of view. You know, the kick drums in the techno tracks were kind of flabby, and but it didn't matter because it was in a mobile game. Yeah. Right. But once we upscale to 4K graphics and to you know headphone platform, that all had to be upscaled as well. So the original mobile audio is out there somewhere. Somebody has a download of it, but the new sound is completely, I re I redid everything. I remastered it. I rebalanced everything. And I brought it up to my, my now four years, five years from that time, my skill set of courses has improved and my listening environment and, and equipment has improved. So there was a, there was also that pipeline of refreshing the existing audio adding the extra hour because when we upscaled to the pc platform we had to add another hour of the radio show because the original radio show is only an hour it ended on the um crowded on my mind was the last song and then it said this broadcast will repeat because we 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 couldn't come up with we didn't have time to come up with more music and there's no inherent gay music there's no dynamic music in golf club wasteland at all right um so (laughs) that was just kind of almost like a desperate hack. It was like, what are we going to do? It, the, the soundtrack is an hour long and it's taking people an hour and 20 minutes to play. And I was like, oh, well, since it's a limited broadcast, just repeat it. Right. And that became in itself a joke, comment on limited bandwidth, corp capitalism, Charlie listening to the same show over and over again. It, it anchors down on the isolation. So it, kind of, it ended up being a happy mistake or a, a happy coincidence that repeating the radio show endlessly actually helps to alienate you somehow. Because if, if you play long enough, you realize that he's stuck in a loop almost. He's literally stuck in a loop. The ga- it sounds like the game itself is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like it's, it's limitations add to the story that you're telling. And those limitations are real. That's what that's what would happen. You would have right. very limited bandwidth. It would be expensive to to broadcast live. It's almost meta. It's like uh, it almost like breaks your brain a little bit thinking about it. I, there's this one puzzle game that I played that I absolutely love. It's called the Talos Principle, and the whole yeah. idea behind that game is that you your character is in a simulation. So any kind of graphical hiccup that you see that is that is part of the game, maybe part of the coding works because you're in a simulation you know what i mean it's, it's yeah i love it um and yeah. what i what i had mentioned about death stranding about that song that plays uh when you come over that hill and you see that gorgeous scenery and how i said i i don't really like that kind of music but it all works together i found it really basically the first song i think that plays or that i remember like when I first took note of the soundtrack, I didn't know going into this game that it would have such an amazing sound design and soundtrack. I remember yeah. uh, Creatures of the World is, I think, the first one that really played where I went, okay, like this, I love this song and it works visually and in terms of the story and thematically. So you kind of ease us in with that stuff. And then you get to the really satirical stuff with the Two Astronauts song. Yeah. So again, like Two Astronauts, that's not necessarily my, the kind of music that I listen to. You know what I mean? It's kind of like absolutely. Acoustic. Yeah, that's the amazing Anna Church, and she's just so wonderful to work with. And um, yeah, so basically, how it works in terms of a, a music production pipeline for the for the radio nostalgia for Mars is that Igor writes the lyrics. The okay. lyrics, it all starts with the lyrics, and the lyrics are, as you mentioned, they are tied to the game. Yes, I love that. So. Yeah, so the, 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 if you listen to the, the, not only is the radio host giving you an insight into life on Mars, but the, the songs themselves are written by people who are ostensibly being affected by the very things that the, that the Mars, the elites try to escape. That's where the nostalgia comes from. So right. the stories are continued through the lyrics of the songs, which you picked up on. And um, <clears throat> so the, the lyrics come first. Then... One of two things happens. Um, Igor will hum a tune okay. in, into his phone and he sends me like, work with this. Okay. And I will go, and like I said, I'm the, I'm the guy, don't, don't say make a song. I say, hum me a tune and then I'll bounce off that. So he's yeah. learned of, of the many years that if he just sends me, sometimes he's very close. He's got a melody that I can pull out. I, I just, I basically auto tune it. I just put him, cause he sings, uh, 
I think he's like around the key of B or something like that. So I just find the nearest notes around B or F sharp or whatever, wherever he's singing. And I generally get a, a melody out of that. Okay. And then from there, I, I do what I do. I just add bass lines, drums, blah, 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 blah. And then we flesh out the demo. And if the demo turns out to be spot on, then that I just take that and develop it into like creatures of the world. Yep. Um, so that, that, that melody, um, I, I wrote that melody. I wrote the top line. I came up with that. And then we just had another person sing it because my singing is, mm, <laughs> I, I would prefer not to sing, but there were budget constraints. So I, time flies. I sing it because we just, we ran out of time and we ran out of budget to get someone to sing it properly. Okay. Um, but, uh, so we, we then hand that song off to an, a, an actual musician or an actual songwriter like Anna. Okay. Um, so there are many, many versions of Take My Hand, for example, before we handed it off to Anna. And again, Anna was in the process of going, eh, actually, it would be cool if we did this and if we added you know, this and why don't we try this? And we're very flexible on that as long as, we're, as, long as it's lightning in a bottle. So for two astronauts, um, we gave the lyrics to Anna just straight and said, please do something with this. And that's what she came up with. Okay. Um, other times we are giving a, a, a strict demo and say, please, uh, for example, like Creature of the World, we love the melody. I just couldn't sing it properly. So we, we approached a, a musician and we did a work for hire say, please just sing this properly. But as it is, like, please don't come up with your own suggestions. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. So it depends on who we're working with. And, and um, the t- time is the biggest factor. Okay. So it's like, do we have time to do it? Is the is the main question. It's like, oh, we can do that. Time and budget. Can we afford it? And do we have time to do it? Are the two major developer questions for audio? So I have a question. I hope this isn't a dumb question, but are you the DJ? Oh uh, yes, I'm the host. Yes, you're the host. Yes, okay. My, yeah, I, yeah, I do the narration. It's so weird. I'm like. Now I'm like doubly starstruck because I love the the soundtrack, like the music and everything as it is. Yeah. And to find Thank out you. that I'm literally talking to the DJ of Radio Nostalgia for Mars, that's so cool. Like oh, thanks, man. Yeah, no, it's me. Um again, <laughs> it's just simply because uh I know how to do it, first of all. Uh I have training in radio. Uh second of all, budget and time constraints. It's just quicker for me to do it. It, it comes down to like just practicalities more than anything else. And I mean, I, I, I've been told that I have that kind of ASMR kind of relaxing voice. And of course I'm hamming it up that I am performing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a very say, famous. I was just going to say, forget budget constraints or whatever, dude, you did like an amazing job. Like that's why I had Thank to ask. Much. I had to ask. I wasn't sure. Cause you yeah, did. That's me. Really will you do is it, I don't, I'm not, this might be, will you do like a line from it for me in the voice, please? Um, oh, okay. Wait, so I need to get into character. Um, yeah, I tell you all you Martians out there, welcome to another edition of Radio Nostalgia from Mars. <laughs> Amazing. So the, the Yaite is a, a Navajo greeting. Okay. And um, it comes from the book uh, Ben Ben Bova, Mars. Okay. And uh, in the very, there is a, a wonderfully constructed um, controversy in the book where a Native American astronaut lands on Mars and he's been given a very specific set of words to say as the first word spoken on Mars. It's all, it's, it's beautifully written political kind of uh, commentary. Right. And he just gets overwhelmed by the environment reminding him of his home, like his reservation back home. So he just instinctively says his Navajo greeting to Mars, Yate. Okay. And I'm, I, I'm butchering the pronunciation. I'm, my apologies to the Navajo nation, but right. um, I thought it would be a, a, a good homage to, um, to, to show the diversity of what's, what would actually happen on Mars given the current climate. But also that that word is voted like top in the top 10 most likely words to be first spoken on Mars. Really? So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a contender for being the first word spoken on Mars. It's very likely that Yate will be the first word spoken on Mars because of Ben Bova's book. It's very That's interesting. Weird. Yeah. yeah. It's a great book. Ma, uh, ben Bova Mars. That was a, that was very influential on the second episode. Well, I was reading, I was reading that around that time and it's just phenomenal. Just the, the tech, the, the, the plausibility of the plot is just phenomenal. It was, it's, it's so fascinating that you say that because the, um, a lot of 
astronauts uh, will credit 2001 for why they wanted to take to the stars. I, I, um, there's this amazing movie. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a documentary called For All Mankind about. Mm-hmm. So well, I'll, I'll know to it. All right. So basically, this is not your this is not your standard documentary where you have footage and then you cut to a person sitting in a chair, like very well lit and they talk about what you're seeing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically it's all archive footage from the Apollo program with the astronauts who went to the moon talking about their experience overlaid, like over the images. Uh, I see the previous one. It's a TV series, right? No, no. So that, that, that's a thing that the guy who made Battlestar Galactica made recently. This is a movie okay. from, from the late eighties. It's a documentary. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll find it. So one of the things they show in that is that the astronauts were allowed to take uh, a cassette, like one cassette of music into space with them. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of them brought. Um, also, I think it, the, the, the cl- famous classical song from 2001. Because it's like the, yes. f- the fiction completely and totally informs the reality to come, I think. Absolutely. The point I was getting. Uh, I th- uh, what's that piece? That, thus spoke Zarathustra. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, but I'm buried in in that um, in the concept of radio nostalgia for Mars in the many late night conversations in Belgrade and Paris um, is the gold record on the Voyager. Yes, yes, I'm familiar with that. So, yes. So I mean, and the fact that um, uh, I'm 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 pardon me for butchering his name, but I'm are you familiar with the Three Body Problem by Lu Xian? I am familiar with it. I've not read it though. Uh, and the dark forest. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I'm Liu Shishin, I think is the correct pronunciation. Please. I apologize for my pronunciation, but um, in that book, um, he talks about the dark forest theory where um, it would be better to keep quiet because any civilization that might, any advanced civilization that might hear us or become aware of us would instantly annihilate us to keep resources in the universe, which are finite to themselves. Okay. It's, it's I'm oversimplifying greatly, right, right. but I mean, the point being is that we've been broadcasting into space since like 1930s. Right. So like all of Hitler's speeches and stuff are just out there, you know, and all, because that was all around that time. Yeah. Um, so the power of radio in terms of exposing us to the universe is not something to be taken lightly given some theories about how we would interact with the alien species. So that was at the back of, of the, um, of the radio nostalgia from Mars is that we're broadcasting again now from Mars, this new set of radio stuff to, to let us let somebody else or some other thing know where we are. Right. And our, so, and our vulnerability, the fact that we're stuck on Mars now. Absolutely. Yeah, vulnerability is a big part of it. I mean, that's where the stories and the lullabies come from. Okay. Um, it, it's just to hearken to this kind of childhood childhood memories. Um, very powerful. We've seen some streamers start crying because they were not expecting to hear like an old Spanish, you know, an old Spanish lullaby coming their way in the middle of a game. Yeah. So that's been quite quite special to watch because, uh, you know, we, I, I've, I've lived and breathed this uh, soundtrack literally for four or five years since the 2017 when it started. Right. So one does become numb. numb. Yeah. To the emotional impact of it. We are, I'm, I'm, we are aware of it, but really for me, there's, it's more of a technical thing. Now oh, that baseline is too loud or that, that hi hat needs to go down in volume. So there's all technical stuff. Um, for example, one of the most powerful pieces that people are really responding to, we were actually considering to remove it because we were not so happy with the quality of the recording. And, and, but I was like, no, it has a charm. There's like a realism to it. In fact, so much so that when we developed the, the second show for the get PC release, um, the, I, 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 I recorded all of the um, callers in my makeshift studio in Belgrade. Okay. And it turned out to sound too good. Because in the previous show, we got people were literally recording on their phones and sending us the M4As or the MP3s. Right. So there was like a built-in quality issue that was charming and worked. Oh, yeah. But when I took over the main recording, it became these super pristine, like studio quality VOs. Okay. So I actually had to degrade them for the show. I had to re... I had to put fake reverb and make it sound like they were talking into a phone because... 
on the first iterations of the new soundtrack, it just sounded, it sounded wrong. It was too, that's not someone calling from right. a, a, a small room in, in a Mars bunker. It was right. someone in the studio away. talking. Yeah. Um, so there was a, there was, a, there was a lot of uh, deliberate degradation going on in, in the show in, in terms of the storytelling, just to create that authenticity. So just one specific reference I want to make, and um, we're, we're at about an hour of recording time. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I'm loving this conversation. Um, no problem. Me too. Thanks, man. So the rhythms born out of hands, is that what it's called? Yes. Yes. So I just have to say as a fan of bands like Nine Inch Nails, KMFDM and Skinny Puppy, you have created like one of the greatest industrial songs I've ever heard. Oh, thank it. you. Seriously, like, I, I had that playing and I was like getting ready for the day like a few days ago. And I literally said outside, I was like, this song is fucking amazing. Like, cause it's, you know, like those in, industrial music, it's like when you first listen to industrial music, you're like, this sounds wrong. Like, why does this, but you have to kind of get into a trance with songs like that. And you realize yeah. like, oh, this is, there's so many layers. And like, you have to listen for a while before it sinks in, like how good it is. But anyway, oh, thank you. That song is so good and it and it benefits you, so much because it's so long it's like six minutes or whatever yeah but man like like to it's just so impressive dude that you that you were involved in making songs like two astronauts and then even the um the song repetition that song repetition, yeah. that song repetition like um skates on the line of of being satire but it's also just really good electronic music Thank you. Well, that's that's uh, well. Rhythms born out of hands is is me. That that that's music that goes back to like two thousand two or something. I think the first iteration of that track came. So when it when I got when we got the message to that we that it was going to be beneficial to extend the radio show for the purposes of releasing on Steam. Okay. Um, because they needed a two hour soundtrack. Uh, minimum and it was originally an hour i then had to go through my kind of after 20 plus years of production back catalog of stuff that just never had a home never had a label because it's a little bit left field you know it's not what what is it really right so um then so i would run a whole lot of tracks past simich and then he would go that one i like that one let's let's do that one so there's this continual push and pull the taste arbiter uh ultimately is ego although i do have a lot of autonomy in what's going into the game um the second half we we again we were crunched for time so that is uh that's going through the old record bin that's all stuff i used to do in live shows and all stuff from my days in tokyo even pre-live shows so i I was very much into playing my own music when i dj so that's all stuff from that time period, uh, 2000, 2003 through 2007, 2008. So there's a kind of, a lot of people coming, oh, this sounds like, you know, early 90s or late 2000 techno. It is. That's why yeah. it sounds like that. And it lends itself to that kind of nostalgia. Yeah. Dude, so there's, I, yeah there's, I love that song, especially Rhythm Born Out of Hands. Like, it's probably the, speaks the most to my taste in terms of like just music on its own. You know what I mean? Would not have oh, been- thank you. Thank you. Um, so when you talk about composers that are, that are big, uh, big influences, that, that would be um, especially from uh, Igor's references. So what, what will happen is along with the humming and, the, and, and Igor's like, I'm amazed he does it because he's so self-conscious of it. But, you know, we've got such good results from it that I think he's kind of over, over himself about doing these weird hummings in the phone. As long as I don't play them to other people, that's, that's the, <laughs> it's just for internal use only. He then will send me a bunch of references. Okay. So he will send me like, we're, we're currently working on the soundtrack for um, the next game we're working on. And he'll send me like a Kanye West as a reference, you know, but only a certain part. And, and we, we timestamp everything. So you'll say, check out this drum sound at, um, check out this drum sound at uh, 502. Right. Whatever. Or I really like how he's done this, conceptually like i like the conceptually visually how it's working and then we'll dissect that and go okay well it's possible but let's do it like this but again it's this push and pull between our creative process so rhythm board of born out of hands was um knowing that uh igor is a big fan of of uh, um 
a uh, a composer called Lorne. Okay. I don't know if you know Lorne. Uh, he sure. did a, uh, uh, let me, uh, you 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 will like Lorne if you like if you like. Um, maybe I'm giving away the the secrets here, but if you like rhythm born out of hands, that's uh, like a an in a, an in joke homage to Igor's like always referencing Lorn for okay. for the game soundtrack. Um, he did a track called Acid Rain. And wait, are you saying L, like L O N or L A W N or L O R N? Oh, okay, Lorne. Okay, okay, got you. Yeah, there, it was for a video game called I can't remember what it was for. Um, it was uh, it was for some game. I'm sorry, my my memory on on games so is okay. flying a million miles now. I'm putting it in my um of my Link. uh, links for you. Cool. It's a great track. So anyway, you'll hear, you'll definitely hear, um, especially with that big synth that comes in over the uh, electronic drums, uh, the kind of organic African drums uh, is heavily, heavily influenced by, by Lawn and, and, um, and his ilk, this kind of um, electronic Vangelis, like heavily distorted kind of Vangelis vibe. Uh, Vangelis is also a big influence, like from film, of course, that's a huge reference from Igor. It's like, make it like Blade Runner. Okay. Which, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it sounds trite, but it it works because it gives me a framework, and as long as I have a framework, I can make something work. Yeah, it's funny. My my composer who makes the music for my podcasts, he that's how he works. He he's like, send me like three songs that are yeah. inspiration, and I'll just send him, yeah. and then he'll send me back something that, I mean, doesn't really sound like what I sent him, but it's the same vibe, you know what I mean? And I'm like, that's yeah, perfect. That's exa- exactly how Ego and I work. And yeah. um, so, um, yeah, I, he, he will send references and um, the stuff that's out of my purview, uh, I don't really do pop that well, like straight up pop, so, or, or rhythm and blues, you know, singer songwriting. So then we would actually, you know, we hire as best we can uh, right. given our budget. So for example, Stockpile, on love we we reached out to the, a very talented uh, katarina peak and she we again that's igor's lyrics my my audio direction but her composing and um adding the lyrics so she did the top line and, and the piano for for stockpile so i'm curious what the, these people that you hire out that you get to collaborate on these songs how much do they know about what they are contributing to like do they know obviously they probably know that it's a video game but how much do you tell them? Do you tell them the storyline? Do, do you show them yeah. visuals? Like, um, how does that work? Well, Igor, uh, when we, I think it was 2018, we won some award for best pitch. So Igor is an, an incredibly good communicator. Okay. So um, when he reaches out, it's, uh, I mean, of course we get people who are not interested in joining the project, but it's, it's very rare. Once, once we've explained what's going on, who we are and what we're doing and what they'll be involved in, people are generally keen. My, the, bar- the biggest barrier for us is, is budget and time. Okay. Because um, when you're juggling um, <clears throat> five different artists at the same time, plus doing the sound design, plus you know um, in implementation through fmod and uh, the middleware stuff to, to actually get the sounds into the game including the audio a golf club wasteland was relatively simple because the music is not dynamic it's, it's basically a file that's triggered and it just plays okay. in the background right. but on more complex games where you've got dynamic audio and stuff you know it takes a lot of time so um Igor handles a lot of the pr on on, on my behalf he'll reach out to the artists Okay. I mean, technically, it's my job, but we've kind of realized that he, it's much quicker if he just reaches out and then I react to them reacting to us. I, I'm very reactive artist. Okay. So um, yeah. I just want to, I do kind of want to transition with the time we have left to sure. maybe some like hard advice for people in this yeah. industry. And what you yeah. just said is a perfect transition because this is a question that yeah. I ask other developers that I talk to. Um, basically, the, this idea that you have, you're an artist, right? And you have a, a vision yeah. and you want to make art, right? But yeah. at a certain point, you realize that you can't do everything and yeah. you have to delegate and you have to yeah. form a team around you. So how do you yeah. have any advice or can you speak to that transition from I'm an artist, I want to make this thing, but now I am on a team of people 
and maybe I'm in a leader position that I wasn't in before, a manager position. Yeah. How does that transition happen? And like, how do you feel about it? Do you have any advice on how to go from artist to still executing my artistic vision, but delegating things to other people? Yeah, that's, that's the perennial question, isn't it? I mean, that's just the, the, the a million dollar question. Um, without naming names, I'll give you an example uh, of uh, like a, uh, on a tangent to, to that question, you know, hopefully an answer it in a way is um, we, we are getting a lot of people communicating with us now because of the, of the visibility of the game, you know, people, Hey, do you need a sound designer? Do you, do you, you know, do you need uh, composers, all this kind of stuff, which is fine. And well, we, we, we do keep a record. We're not, we don't necessarily respond okay. because sometimes it's uncalled for if that makes sense. Um, I just say, I'm, so, is it- I'm sorry to interrupt because you're saying that. I just want to say, I appreciate 100% you're taking the time and responding to me. So uh, no, that's fine. no, that's absolutely not. That's a, that's a different thing entirely. I mean, okay. I, uh, but, but the, the, the point being is that uh, we, we um, um, many, many people have reached out to us, but 90% of the time, one can almost get the impression uh, of, uh, have you seen the movie School of Rock? Yes. With Jack Black? Yeah. Okay. That, 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 kind of person is called a practice room monster and when i was a kid we uh i formed a death metal band and my dad and i were looking for rhythm guitarists and we were in a guitar shop uh picking up some strings for me or something like that and we saw this guy just wailing on a guitar like wow like mind-blowing and we said dude you have got to come and join my band like be in my band you're amazing and when he got into the when he got into the studio uh, into our rehearsal room, which was our garage in South Africa at the time, we literally could not play with the guy. We could not play with him. He was Jack Black in the School of Rock. Okay. And unfortunately, a lot of younger guys coming up are are working in isolation, and especially they now. are ex- yeah extreme, especially now. And it's a double edged sword. So what's happening is they're extremely good at what they're doing. But um, they, it's very difficult to give direction. Right. So if you want to work on a team, um, you, you're going to have to have a thick skin is my, my biggest advice. Is you just got to learn when to shut up and when to do what you're told in the nicest possible way. Because there's overarching things, especially when you've got uh, budgets and timelines um, and, and uh, milestones and there's, you know, people's uh, salaries are on the line. Yeah. We, 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 it doesn't matter if you've used the sample or not. It doesn't matter if you've created that gunshot from slapping your slipper on the wall and, you know, and, you know, uh, I don't know what it is that you did to get the gunshot. We just need a gunshot. So um, it's, it's a fine line between artistic integrity. Of course, we respect that, but also in terms of delivery and getting the job done, like a result trumps everything. Okay. For us, for me personally, result trumps process. Right. I agree. So, and a, a lot of a lot of bedroom producers, a lot of bedroom sound designers, they are all about the process, and they present themselves as being all about the process. But the process it takes a long time. We don't have time. Time is the biggest issue in in development. There's no time to unless you're working with massive budgets, and even then, you don't have time. You don't have the luxury of uh, making your sound design real for three weeks to get it perfect. You've yeah. got one day to deliver the sound of the squirrels grabbing a ball because the build is going to um, the build is going for localization and it's going for porting yeah. on Monday. Yeah. If it doesn't go, we're not going to get paid. Exactly. So there's just like, there's just unfortunately we uh, in the capitalist kind of systems that we're working in. That's just how it is at the moment. Right. It's, so my advice to to um, sound designers is is I, I admire the the effort and the artistic integrity, but at some point it doesn't work in a realistic situation. Okay, you know, and and on a, on a lot of online forums, everybody's like, oh, sample rates and all this kind of stuff, and so it's fine and well if you have the time, by all means, chase that unicorn. But in reality, it doesn't matter. What matters is the idea and the execution and the result. That's all that matters. Yeah. And that it works. It reminds me, um, this might be a stretch, but have you ever seen the movie White Men Can't Jump? Yes. So there's a part where 
and it's it's about race, but I think it speaks to this what we're talking about here. Uh, he says he claims about the other guy, you'd rather look good and lose than look bad and win, right? Yes. So it kind of reminds me of what you're saying, and that yeah, it's absolutely. Like, it's like, listen, I want to shine because I had this really good idea, but does that idea work with our timeline and our budget and reaching this end goal that we all agreed we were aiming for? Right. Absolutely. It's, and it's about, it's literally about teamwork. It sounds cheesy, but there's, there is no I in team, blah, blah, blah. It's really right. true. And um, <clears throat> what, what I've done, because I, I have worked on really large campaigns for Red Bull and Clash of Clans and Riot Games and stuff is that, um, that, should you enter into that world that is not it's not your work if okay. that makes sense um so it, it's the work of a team right sure okay. you'll get credit for it and if you are very much into your work then do your own project it's that simple okay or at least do your day job and then do some kind of pet project on the side so that's how I kept saying by doing all of these um, Red Bull campaigns and all that kind of stuff, because that's just straight up music to brief. It's like at 30 seconds, can you please take away that piano and can you add a transition? At 15 seconds, we don't really like that um, vocal chop. Can you make that a guitar? You know, so it's just these constant. It's not about what I want. It's about what the client wants. Right. But to keep that sanity, I have tracks that I've been working on for decades, just because that's my outlet. That's where this is how I want it to be. Right. So I, I have this vent. That's how I do it. Everybody will, will find a different way of doing it. But right. I do suggest that you have some kind of pet project or hobby in within music realm. But to function in a team, you can't really, you don't have that luxury to to do what you want. Um, although I, I'm, I'm being a bit, I do, but that's just because we are a pretty unusual team to begin with because we come from the film and art background. Right. I would, I would, I mean, I would say that a lot of what you've talked about so far points to the fact that you and your team demagogue are extremely unique um, in so many ways. So I think that comes. They're they're all friends from high school. So the original game was done uh, after work. They were, they were coding at night. So and, um, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm curious about you. Were you in Japan while making all this music or were you with them while you were creating? No, I left, I left Japan 2011, December 21st, 2011, which was a couple of months after the big earthquake. Okay. Uh, not related. My moving, my leaving Japan was not related to the earthquake. Um, it was planned long before the earthquake happened. Unfortunately, a lot of people got the impression that I left <laughs> a lot of my Japanese. Um, I had some fans at the time uh, on my techno scene and they, they, some of them were a little bit, you know, upset that I was leaving right. because they conflated the, the earthquake with me leaving, but it wasn't the case. So I landed in Belgrade <clears throat> around 2012 and, um, was adjusting, didn't know what to do. Um, and I, I decided that I would, uh, the only way to meet people was to go and study. So I went to SAE. Um, what does it stand for? I forget. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So it's like an audio school, very okay. famous private audio school. I did one year there and that's where I met Igor. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, were you guys um, together while making the radio nostalgia from Mars physically? So that's what I'm saying. So I was, I met Igor and then uh, he actually had another sound guy <clears throat> okay. and that sound guy kind of was like, oh, I'm, I'm too busy. Can you, can you just take over for me and do this thing with the, the, the video game with the slapping the kids to keep them awake on the sweatshop. <laughs> okay. And um, then Igor said, Oh, you know, I've got this other thing that I'm doing. And Igor was just from that point on, we've been working. <clears throat> I then moved to Paris okay. in 2014. Okay. Yes, yeah, sometime in 2014, and that's where the that's where the idea for the game was bubbling. Got it. Uh, then my daughter was born, and then most of that music production was done remotely from Paris. The first album, uh, the first episode, was done right. in Paris from Paris. So that was all remote work. So, do you have any advice for people making video games who have to work remotely? Is kind of what I was getting to. Yeah. Um, it's not, I, uh, 
no, I, I don't actually, because I, I, it's just such a modern part of life that if right. you haven't got your head around working remotely or being online to discuss stuff, you're going to have trouble, I guess. Yeah. I don't know what to say about it. Um, it is difficult uh, just in terms of the, a lot of the lightning in the bottle um, hitting the right melody. So, for example, um, the Surveillance Love Song yeah. uh, is actually originally a full-on jazz piece that I composed okay. sitting next to Eagle. Wow. So again, we had the lyrics and I had done a bunch of demos with me playing. <clears throat> and I, to this day, even if, if, if Simich was sitting next to me, we would start, he, we would start grinning because when we hit that melody, when it started working, we were literally like jumping around the room. It was like, you can't do that remotely. Right. It just doesn't happen. So there is uh, with music, Music is different remotely than sound design. Sound design is 100% remote. It, it pretty much always has been to a certain extent because the sound design team has been in another part of the building or they've been remote anyway. Right. Um, so sound design is pretty easy because you're responding to game objects, not to people. Right. right? right. So you, you get a build and depending on your, your proficiency, uh, my other deep piece of advice is to learn how to code. Most young guys can, but if you want to get into the, game dev like audio dev learn how to code get your head around c plus or whatever it is because i that's my biggest barrier at the moment that's why i'm i love working with our team because the dev they cover my ass on that front got it so but working remotely for music very difficult got it okay because a lot gets lost in translation especially through email yes i'm sure yeah i yeah. when i when i uh talk to my composer about my podcast music it's often, it's like back and forth. It's like, I'll send him songs, I'll text him. But then when it, when it comes down to the final product, they usually just go to his house and I'm like, okay, yeah, do this, change that. Okay, yeah, perfect. Let's, exactly. that, that's the way to do it. So what was happening is periodically I was able to get back to Belgrade and in those like three or four weeks, we would solidify a lot of the stuff. It just for music, face to face just trumps everything, unfortunately. I know there's a lot of collaborative online stuff and I know a lot of young kids are more comfortable being online. Right. It's definitely similar to tonight. There's a chemistry that just doesn't translate musically through the web. Like I said, sound design is not a problem. You, you're reacting to a, a game build and game objects. So it's like, oh, we need a flower to sound like it's puking. Done. I'll, I'll have it for you tomorrow. It's in the next build. Right, right. But like, oh, uh, for example, some some artists they 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 don't understand direction, and some artists uh, are, are are artists uh, that haven't really worked with direction before. Okay, great, right, right. So um, they tend to do whatever they want, and it's not what we need. And it comes back to that kind of um, teamwork again. And right. it's totally understandable. It's fine. I mean, that we just then we recognize that that's this kind of artist is into contributing what they want to contribute. Uh, and then if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, then we, we move on. But uh, we recently, for example, again, no names, but we worked with a guy where we pretty much have the song is set we love it we love the melody and he just couldn't vibe with it he was like he tried and it was just the, the pacing was off the tone was okay and then i we said to him look dude it's just not working out it's because uh, we don't want we don't want something else to happen to the song the, the song is there right we right. like it you just and then we found another, yeah and then we found another guy and he was like bam 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 three working days later Beautiful. we were like damn son <laughs> thank you so much this is what we wanted the other guy to do not knocking the other guy it's just right, right. We, didn't, we didn't vibe with him and it's fine but Igor and I are in a, on a, uh, uh, we've been doing it for so long that we know what we want right and okay. we're not and like I, I agree with I, I, I appreciate what you said in one of the emails it's like we're not chasing clicks and shares and likes it's like none of the music that we're doing is bowing to Spotify or YouTube algorithms we just, I just don't care about that stuff Right. I don't, we, we, we sent a lot of the songs to like um, YouTube channels and stuff and they go, oh, the intro is too long. Can you make it to It's like, no, the intro is as long as it is. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not interested in like chasing AI algorithms for music production. It doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So I, I, had, I had just three more questions, but you, you made me want to ask another one. Okay. That's fine. What is the strategy behind... Um, the availability of the Radio Nostalgia from Mars as an album. I noticed that the only way I could get it was through some kind of code 
that was given to me after I beat the game? Yes, um, that's the, the strategy there was um, to drive sales through um, making the soundtrack exclusive. Okay. So there's kind of um, an in-joke in a way. It's like the soundtrack for an exclusive radio show for the exclusive on Elite, Elite on Mars is now exclusive part of the game. So there's kind of like a, an in-joke there, but it's also, it's also strategic for sales. Right. I mean, you know, I, so it's like you would have to get the game to get the soundtrack at this point. Like that's, I know that music, I like, I'm not even that old, but like, I remember when I would go to a music store and buy CDs. I loved doing yeah. that. Um, yeah. so it's not the same model anymore, but like if I saw radio nostalgia from Mars on a CD shelf and I like read what it was, I would totally buy it. Like without the, yeah. game, you know what I mean. This this uh, this strategy is is uh, again again working on a team is is completely out of my hands. That that right. was a top down decision. It's that that's how the marketing marketing team saw fit, and I, I stand by it. And they know what they're doing. I'm I'm not a marketing I'm not a marketing guy. Not what? not a bone in my body. Once so, I realized that option was there, though, I swiftly figured out how to download that. I have it on my phone. <laughs> I have Thank it on my you. phone. I have it on my computer. I listen to it like, you know. You have, I mean, I can send you a copy if you need, but if you already have it, it's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I have it on my computer. It's, it's awesome. And it comes with the, yeah. with the art and everything. I, I dig it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to get into this, the last three questions. And they might not be, sure. they might not quite pertain to you because you're the sound designer. Um, sure. But I ask everyone because I like to hear the, the different answers. So sure. what is something that you want gamers to know? about indie game development or video game development in general? What is a, a message that you would send to the gamer about what you Mes- do? The number one message that I would send to gamers is that they're, they're, these are people making a game. Okay. And um, you think, uh, you think I, gamers I, get I, that? It is incredibly difficult to make a game. Incredibly difficult. And even something as simple in inverted quotes as a golf game is incredibly difficult to pull off. So when you scale that up to something like all of the, the kind of contra- controversy around cyberpunk, right. um, like what those guys are doing is astonishing, right. even with all the problems that they had on launch and stuff like that. And the amount of the lack of understanding from the gaming community of just how awesome that is anyway, despite the bugs, right. that is astonishing what those guys did. Right. Did they handle it incorrectly? <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. But suffice to say is that I see far too much on gaming forums and stuff, um, people just really not understanding that mistakes happen, bugs right. happen, and that there's people behind it. And people... Um, that that are genuinely invested in that game. They care about it. Right. And they probably care about it more than the game it does. Or in fact, they do care about it more than the game it does. So I think... So, yeah. I just think, be human. Be, be kind. Right. <laughs> That's my... Yeah, and I think kind. what I want to just play off that real quick is that um, basically, I think it may be potentially could be easy to make a shallow gaming experience. Maybe not easy, but easier than what I learned just now in this conversation with you, that you and your team went through so much to create this game. That's just a little square on a, on a virtual store that people pay for and play yeah. and hope that it's good. Yeah. And I learned that so much went into it. And the reason I love it so much and the reason I think it is so impactful to me and it is a deep experience with many, many levels is because it was hard to do. You know what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it does It does come through. I mean, you can see a lot of people that are inexperienced. Their, their gameplay is, is, um, is, is lacking or the story is lacking. That's fine. Everybody's on a different path. But I mean, there's a lot of guys out there just trying to cash in on certain themes and stuff. And I mean, uh, when we were at um, the Unite uh, Berlin, we were invited uh, to go through because we were in there. Uh, we were on the shortlist for best Unity film for our uh, for our. I think it was for our um, music video for um, Distant Thunder, 
was nominated for best uh, best unity use of unity in a music video. Wow. So we were up against uh, Disney and uh, Oat Studios. Uh, Neil Blomkamp, who did oh, uh, yeah. District Nine, yeah. yes, yes. So that's good to be in 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 the running with a fellow South African. Yeah. Um, so we were invited to go up uh, 2018, I think it was, and. Um, one of the lectures I went to, um, because there's many game devs, it's like a GDC, but a Unity branded. Right, right. Um, like, a, what do they call it? Like a main event, or whatever. Like, okay. So we watched the one guy and his entire talk was about how he monetized cloning successful games. Like basically making not Clash of Clans, but Clash of Clones or whatever. Right, right. That, that as a plastic example where, you know, people would accidentally download it or, you know, it's like a, like a B grade version of the game, but heavily monetized and wow. heavily lucrative. And it was a, just a, a given in the industry that once you had a successful game like Fortnite, there would be a million copies of Fortnite and they would all make very good money if you knew how to monetize them properly. That was the whole gist of the talk. So I leaned over to Simich and I'm like, holy shit, this is like fucking terrifying because uh, have, you seen, have you seen Good Morning Vietnam? Yes, with, uh, Robin Williams. Yeah, you know yeah. he does that joke. The GDC with the OPA has done the GDK with an MP nine A two A. He does all like the military like acronyms or whatever. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um. This guy, his whole speech was just like, uh, yeah. So what you got to do is you got to get the player to you maximize player dependency PDA on the NDA to get the PDCs to play and play through discrepancy advertising. You know right. all this like weird jargon endlessly, endlessly. And I turned to. I said, this is crazy. And he goes, oh man, you should have seen the Facebook talk in like in, uh, in New York or somewhere because he was at another gaming convention. It's like these guys, they, they just exist in this realm of making money off these clones. So there, there is that aspect. But the majority of indie games is people doing what they love and doing their best at it. So yeah. Just be kind to them. It's very simple. Just be kind to them. I agree. That's, that's what I've yeah. learned. In the, in the, I haven't done... I haven't, I'm not a seasoned indie game developer interviewer, but I've interviewed yeah. about eight to 10 people at this point. And it, like you, I mean, it's stupid to say, but like you guys are all just human and you're artists. Yeah. Like you're yeah, trying absolutely. to make a thing that in order to continue making that thing, you have to sell that thing. So you're yes. all trying to find this balance of art and I guess, you know, monetization. Um, yeah. It's a balance between art and commerce and commerce generally wins. Right. Um, so, for example, we have a lot of um, censorship in the game because we have to meet certain age limits or age, okay. you know, they're very strict on age, especially in Australian markets and in the European markets. So, you know, there's like little, there's lots of little things that gamers are completely unaware of, which kind of shocks me because I can't imagine being a gamer and not being aware a little bit of what it takes to develop a game but i mean that's just my my brain you know I, that's how i function as a human being but there there certainly are people who just play games and don't give a hoot how it was made and they just want it to work and be perfect but that's not that's not the charm of a game i don't think no no yeah um i agree um and that's kind of it's very point. tough that's the point of this podcast is to highlight you guys to the people who yeah. make the games um yeah i guess yeah we do it so, we love it <laughs> yeah so uh so Second to last question, what is one piece sure. of advice, like one distilled, like best piece of advice for other developers, for other indie game developers who are currently making a game? If you have anything you could distill. Um, yeah, you've just got to find that balance between art and commerce. Okay. The, the, business, the business side of it is inescapable. Yeah. And the longer that you kind of resist it or buck it, um, the the less chance you have of of being successful and 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 being successful is determined only by you i think dave chappelle says it says it in one of his interviews where he says you just got to know your price okay you just got to know when too much is too much and be able to step away from that deal yeah and just make sure that that you that that um the parties that you're getting involved with have your best interests at heart some don't some do yeah but that requires a bit of savviness, that, and that's a business savvy. I'm the last to, person to speak to about the business side of things because that's handled by the guys in the team. Okay. Um, we have some wonderful. We have a we have a biz dev. That's his job. Okay. So again, delegation is very important. Okay. I I I know you see these fantasy stories and romantic stories of like the one guy 
you know, genius who made everything and stuff, and they do exist. Yeah. But um, that's burnout. You never see anything from them again. Right. Yep. No, I, yeah. No. Yeah. In general. Yeah. That's like one, one game and they're done. But most of the time they've done very well, so they, they can. But Yeah. Or you, know, you have like 10 year development cycles where it's like yeah. this person's output is like three games in four decades. But yeah, um, exactly. Anyway. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's like uh, one of my favorite music producers is a guy called Richie Horton. And, and okay. he said, you know, the music, music is 50% music and 50% business. It's, it's, they, they go hand in hand. If you don't handle the one, you can't handle the other. Right. Because you need to get paid to do what you're doing. Right. Unless you're like super indie and you, you live in your, you live with your parents. So you in a, a com, uh, comfortably financially off, you've got a day job. Yeah. Keep your day job, by the way. Another big advice. Do okay. it in your spare time. That's how we did it. And then we, 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 tra- we transgressed into becoming a fully fledged company just based on, you know, not giving up our day jobs. That's awesome. But at some point, you're going to have to make, you're going to have to take that risk. You're going to yeah. have to say, ah, it's, I, I need to spend more time on this than I do at work. Yeah. Find a compromise or quit. Yeah. I quit my day job in uh, June and I'm the, uh, for the first time, I'm like doing this whole starting my own business. Yeah. It's you fun. Join, join the club. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's where I, that's, that's where I'll leave it at that is, you know, um, get your head around the business and get your head around the art and then find, find the balance. Right. I think that's, I think yeah. that's really good advice. I've heard from quite yeah. a few people, similar sentiments. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I have enjoyed this conversation immensely. Uh, I, yeah, I, thank I, you very much, Jared. I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Uh, the last question I ask all my guests is, could you possibly call out another developer, either someone you know, or just someone in the game development scene, or even just uh, the, the musical scene in games, someone that you want to call out that you think would make a great guest on this show, uh, someone that if they were on my show tomorrow, if the show is going uh, live tomorrow, you would listen in because you would want to hear from this person. Who would that be? Yeah, that that would definitely be my friend Bion from Kyoto. He's okay. uh, the he's the artistic director and music director behind a very popular game called uh, Pixel Junk Eden. He's okay. a wonderfully non-combative um, like uh, platformer. I'm aware of it. Yeah. Oh, Organic, beautiful. I think the the company is Q Games or something like that from Kyoto. Okay. Yeah, he's uh, um, he's he's just an amazing amazing all round artist. He's a visual artist. He's a, a techno DJ. I, I've, I've DJed with him many times down in Kyoto back in the day. <clears throat> he, he's always very kind to me. Um, I'll definitely see what I can do about introducing you to him. But if but yeah, his name is Bion B A. I Y O N. He's done a few GDCs as well. He's, he's pretty out there. He did the um, the interactive control music controls for the the PlayStation Three One for Little Big Planet Two. He oh, was yeah. behind all the music systems for that. Very cool. Um, he he's the guy that recently he did the revamped audio for Frogger, the Nintendo's. I think it was a Nintendo re release of Frogger for Switch okay. that he was involved in. That there's plenty of, of him online talking about what he does. Right. He's on. a very cool guy. Yeah, okay. we connect over One Piece. Okay, um, so he's a big One Piece fan, as am I. So we 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 kind of always, you know, just throwing One Piece lines at each other randomly across time. So okay. I've reached out to him. I haven't heard from him, but he's very busy right now. Okay, um, fine. yeah, he's yeah. he's the guy that I would Thank call you. out. Um, I love what he's doing, and he's he's always interesting. <laughs> Very cool. We love that's, him. That's awesome. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to go after him. I'm going to try to get him on the show. I appreciate um, the call out. And uh, basically last thing will be, where can people find you? If they want to hear from you, like whatever it is like online, if you have a website or also yeah. where can they get the game? Uh, yeah. So uh, as for me, uh, people will rapidly find out that I'm not much of a social media kind of guy. So you can drop by my website, shaneberry.com. Okay. Uh, my Twitter is shaneberry at, at shaneberry on Twitter, but I mostly just post uh, photos from my photo project. Um, and then I don't do Instagram. I have an Instagram account, but it's blank. It has a spinning wheel because I don't know what to do with it. Wow. And um, uh, yeah, I'm just too busy. 
I'm too busy for that social media stuff, to be honest. Yeah. Like I, I'm just, I'm that age where it's, it's behind me. So yeah. my website, Bandcamp, Shameberry, Bandcamp, Bandcamp, I'm on SoundCloud. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Apple Music for other stuff. Spotify, I'm on Spotify, of course. I did. I found um, you on Apple Music. You have some pretty cool music on there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's all back in the day. I've got tons of stuff that's like in a pipeline. Just uh, like I said, I need a framework. So I haven't quite found the framework for a lot of the stuff once I stopped doing live shows. But yeah, SoundCloud, Shaneberry, um, Bandcamp, uh, Shaneberry, RNFM will be coming. We will stop pre orders, I think, in November. For what? Um, for, I'm for, sorry. Radio, for Radio Nostalgia from Mars will start in November and we should do an official release in February uh, of 2022. That's the current timeline. You're releasing what? For like a- releasing the album for sale. Like physically? Separate from the game. Yeah. Uh, well, there is there, there will be a couple of vinyls as far as we know, yeah. but they'll be collector's items, probably okay. internal only. But um, yeah, uh, in terms of going online, like streaming platforms and being available to buy like from Apple Music, uh, yeah, that's, that's scheduled for um, February 2nd, 2022. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, maybe earlier, uh, but you know, I, I, I can let you know yeah, yeah. Um, in, in the background if, if need and, be. And where can people get the game? Like what system? Oh, the game are- uh, uh, from golfclubwasteland.com will take you to the several several platforms that you can buy. There's a Steam link, a PlayStation uh-huh. link, uh, Xbox link. Yeah, that's the best place to get the game. Or on Steam, just search golfclubwasteland.com. Right. Just one word, golfclubwasteland. Yeah. yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I can't thank you enough. We went way over the time that I had initially told you, but I, it's I, had, fine. Fun. No, I had fun I, talking. I had a great time. Yeah, good luck editing it all. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, that wraps up my conversation with Shane Berry. A massive thank you to him for joining me and giving us his time and knowledge. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget to check out the game Golf Club Wasteland on PC, Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox. Find out more about the game specifically at golfclubwasteland.com. You can find Shane Berry's work on his website, shaneberry.com, as well as on Twitter at Shane Berry and on Bandcamp and also on SoundCloud. I'm on Twitter at IndieGameIntl, as well as on the web at SumadrePodcasts.com. If you want to sponsor this podcast or you have a suggestion for a great future guest, you can tweet at me or email me at SumadrePodcasts at gmail.com. Okay, I asked Shane if I could play a quick sample from Radio Nostalgia from Mars, and he graciously agreed. So, I will leave you with a clip from the track Creatures of the World, which is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, Thank you so much for joining me, and thank you so much one more time to Shane. All right, have an amazing day. Stone